Hi everyone, I'm Sin from Art Science Museum in Singapore. Thank you for joining us in this closing talk organized as a part of a program of online conversations accompanying the exhibition Radical Curiosity in the Orbit of Buckminster Fuller presented at Art Science Museum in co-production with Foundation Telefonica Madrid and guest curators Rosa Pera and Jose Luis de Vicente. The exhibition considers the profoundly relevant legacy of one of the greatest minds of our times, Richard Buckminster Fuller. Describing himself as a comprehensive anticipatory design scientist, Fuller dedicated his life to making the world work for all of humanity tackling global problems surrounding housing, shelter, transportation, education, energy, and ecological stewardship. His impact on the world today can be found in his continued influence upon generations of designers, architects, scientists, and artists working to create a more sustainable planet. Fuller's projects operated at the intersection of scientific inquiry and utopian idealism and were made rich and complex by his tireless optimism, creative collaborations and cultural connections. He drew from his interactions and friendships with Greenwich Village Bohemians in the 1920s, Black Mountain College college colleagues in the late 40s, um, cold warriors in the 50s, counter thinkers in the 60s and 70s, and architects in Southeast Asia in the 70s and 80s. It's an absolute privilege having Datuk Sri Lim Chong Kiat headline the closing program of Radical Curiosity exhibition. Trained at the University of Manchester and MIT, Datuk Sri Lim is a pioneering figure in Singapore's post-independent architectural history with a remarkable legacy in Southeast Asia. His body of work under his firm's Malayan Architects Co-Partnership and Architects Team 3 includes monuments and landmarks such as the Singapore Conference Hall and Jurong Town Hall in Singapore, Negri Sembilan State Mosque in Surimban, and Komta Tower in Penang. He was active in the formation of the Singapore Institute of Architects, becoming its third president, and he served on public boards here, including the Housing and Development Board, Land Appeals Board, and UN Review Panel for State and Plan City Planning. Besides being a prominent practitioner, Datuk Sri Lim helped establish the first school of architecture in Singapore and taught the first batches of architectural graduates at the Singapore Polytechnic. Datuk Sri Lim played important roles internationally as well. He served on the steering committee for the Commonwealth Association of Architects and is the former chairman of its Board of Architectural Education. He's also the founder chairman of the Architects Regional Council Asia. Beyond his architectural accomplishments, Datuk Sri Lim is a polymath known for the range of his, his interests and capabilities that extends into art, music, ethnography, and botany. It's a real privilege to be joined by Datuk Sri Lim in this closing program for Radical Curiosity exhibition as he joins us in conversation to talk about the regional story of Buckminster Fuller through the more than decade long friendship which they share. Um, hi, Datuk Sri. It's an absolute pleasure having you join us today from Penang. Nice um, I, I would love to start. Uh, I would love to start by asking you about your first meeting with Buckminster Fuller, Datuk Sri. Both of you met in 1971. Um, could you share with us how did this encounter happen and what do you remember about it? Yeah, I guess it's relevant that I do time travel back 50 years to 1971. Uh, actually, it was in connection with the Commonwealth Association of Architect Activities in India that I was visiting New Delhi. And I happened to hear that his associate, Shoji Sadao, who is a very important collaborator for Bucky, was going to be in Delhi with him. So we arranged to meet, and I first met him in the Ashoka Hotel in uh, New Delhi. So that was my first impression of Bucky. And we appear to have got on uh, very in a very special way because he then told me that uh, he was due that year to travel to Bali in, in the typical American way, maybe just spend one day there, fly in and out. Uh, I was slightly surprised because I think he was really having problems health-wise. And I said to him, I better come with you to Bali. 
The other interesting connection, because Bali was actually the starting point of our friendship, because he said that he had aborted a trip to Bali the year before, because his friend, Rosa Covarrubias, the widow of Miguel Covarrubias, the famous Mexican uh, painter and communist, by the way, had planned to go there, but she died. And that was a very interesting connection because I knew Rosa as well in America and had stayed with her in Mexico City. And I was wondering why she never replied to my letter. Now only to Bucky heard that she had died. So that starts off with more than just uh, with a travel uh, destination. So in December, Bucky came to Singapore. And then I think it's of interest particularly to Singaporeans that uh, the TV people in Singapore, Chandra Mohan, the director, heard that Bucky was around and told me that I must deliver him for an interview when he came back from Bali. So I think in the back here, you can see one of our early images taken in Bali when Bucky was there. And when he was there, he met my Balinese friends and made a model of the Tensegrity Dome in Bamboo. It was going to be realized later, which I'll get around to talking to that. So he brought this model back, which was used in the TV interview. And uh, I think it's very interesting to revisit that, because when I brought him to the studio, uh, they said, why are you dressed up? I said, why should I be dressed up? They said, you're supposed to interview him, which I did not know. So they rushed me in, made up, and put me in the suit, which I did not have a suit at the time. So that was how I did the first interview with Bucky in Singapore. And then uh, subsequent years, he came back and then I have a record of Bucky visiting Bali and Singapore with me over the next few years. So we had uh, a lot of sharing and getting Bucky to meet people and people to meet Bucky. And quite, shall we say, uncommercially. It was all on a very friendly basis. You know, he wasn't there. As a visiting luminary being paid a huge fee to be listened by people, as is, is a habit with some people. So it was always open to meeting people. That's how it happened. Um, there are so many sort of rich connections to uncover, and maybe we could begin um, by talking about the Camp One World Meetings first. So both of you together had convened the Camp One World Meetings, and these were gatherings discussing world affairs, um, first in Bali in 1976 and 77, I believe, and then subsequently um, they transmigrated to Penang in 1982 and 1983. Um, Datuk Sri, what was the impetus for organizing this exchanges? How did the meetings um, unfold across the years? And what can you share about the sort of confluence of relationships um, that happened across these gatherings? In, in retrospect, the Bucky uh, connection for the Champa meetings, I think it's quite significant because it firstly showed how much you got to know Bali and Southeast Asia in a very different way from just as a visiting dignitary or celebrity. And actually, I have here a guest book of his visits to Bali, his inscriptions, and how many times we revisited after that first meeting in 71. And incidentally, he always brought other people along, apart from Choji Sadao, he brought his grandson there. So he came more than just a normal tourist. And, uh, well, frankly, because I had a house in Bali, mm. but had very intimate exposure to the Balinese friends and so on. And uh, so it must have sunk into him. Then one day, he and another great friend of ours called Austin Coates, who actually uh, was invited by Singapore to be advising on tourism at that time. Uh, we, we met and Bucky suggested we should hold what he called the Champuan meeting. Champuan, by the way, is the name of the village outside Ubud, right. at the confluence of two rivers. You know, So it has a bit been symbolic, it was a coming together of people. And uh, Bucky had huge connections and the people he invited, although they could not turn up, include people like Gusto, Jorge Dow, and people like that, and Arthur Clark. Uh, but you will hear who actually turned up. And if not in, in, in person, uh, they were really quite connected. The purpose of the Champa meeting was to talk about the world in a free sort of way, and really the future of the world. Because I think what must be established 
beyond any exhibition is Bucky, the global humanist. And I hope beyond seeing the artifacts, people read his books and read his books even more than just hearing him. Because that was actually the background to the Champagne meeting. The other unique thing was that we decided we would invite people who come on their own steam, not being paid by some foundation or represent some big business group. So it was a really uh, a meeting of personal feeling that could exchange. And then we also decided no honorifics. We dropped all their doctorates or honors, you know, sir, whatever we don't, you just call people by first names. So that created the possibility of a two exchange. And I think the memories of those four events, uh, I hope to set down in print because as you may have heard, I am prevailed on to try to write my memoirs about Bucky, knowing him over 12 years, until 10 days before he died, actually, in 83. So that does that give you a flavor. But the setting in Bali is so, so uh, full of culture. And mm -hmm. I think Bali, uh, both Bucky, the visitors, and of course myself, realized that Bucky stood then and still now as a very important example for the world of a continuing civilization that is still resisting certain of the deleterious aspects of modernization. So, and of course, the famous saying uh, by Nehru, he called Bali the morning of the world. And that's where we can find really new clues about uh, uh, civilization, actually mm -hmm. old clues, the new. Um, there's another connection that I would love to talk to you about as well. Um, Dr. Sri, you were involved in the design and the implementation of Comta in Penang as the director of the Development Consortium. And Comta's iconic um, Dewan Tonku Jurassic Dome is, of course, a testament to the strong influence of Fuller. Um, can you share the story behind this with us? Yeah, I sort of anticipated that you would ask me about Comta. <laughs> I think I'm going to send you some images from the great brochure we wrote, because a lot of people have misunderstood Comta in the background. It's actually all explained. And uh, actually, after meeting Bucky, you see, I had actually known about this work, although I never met him when I was in the States. Mm. And, uh, but I had a great interest in acoustics. And uh, two of my great teacher, Bob Newman, was also became a friend of Bucky. We were looking at domes like the the Kaiser Dome in Hawaii, and seeing the acoustic problems of the, the dome. When you, if, you, if you don't do the dome properly, you have funny echoes inside. So when we designed Comta, I decided to have a multi-purpose dome that was authentic. So instead of trying to copy it or get other people to trip from Bucky, we invited him and Shoji Sadao, the consultants for the Dome in the multi purpose dome in Comta, which was a 145 foot dome, uh, which could hold sports and so on. You know, for example, we actually had an exhibition match of badminton featuring Eddie Chung, Erlen Cops, and so on there, which I think even people in Penang have forgotten. And the dome was called the Day One Tunku uh, after the first Prime Minister. And it was also an occasion where we could. Uh, show people what Bucky had done. We had one of the first big exhibitions in there, inside the dome, together with a display of the, the big map. So uh, actually, in those days, we were in no hurry to finish all this, uh, maybe budget was such that we took our time. Uh, Bucky visited Penang, and then we had the Champan meetings in uh, 82 and 83. He visited the construction, but the dome had not started. So he did visit Comta, he knew the background. He also introduced him to a lot of people. He held an exhibition in the State Art Gallery. But he, of course, passed away in 83. The dome was actually only open in 86. Mm -hmm. But his memory we created a really big exhibition there. So, uh, you know, people in this region, in Penang, in Singapore, Bali, actually had the chance of knowing Bucky so well even before exhibitions that came later. Um, I'll uh, add another note because uh, we know that some ill-informed people have been writing the wrong things about Comta. That 
uh, as if it was just a building. Uh, Comta is a subject of urban planning for the center of Georgetown and had a lot of studies to justify it. But of course, politically, some people tried to distort the picture. But anyway, history has been well recorded and uh, good historians should see the real background. And I believe that actually very little studies have been made equivalent to what they did for this, what was then called the urban center for the civic project. So Bucky's dome, incidentally, could be said to be his last major world project, which is not even known in the States. But it has been published in a four volume record of his works, the Architects of Bucky Fuller. And funny enough, until I brought the copy out recently, I never realized that embossed in the cover is the Comta Dome. But, you know, memory is such that people, even in Penang, do not realize the significance of Bucky Fuller's last work. You know, we'll talk about Bucky in the States where people knew of the connection. But anyway, it's good that you had this exhibition in Singapore. And then Singaporeans, many had contact with him too. And that's something that we may talk about if you are interested. While talking about Singapore, um, Bucky's connection with um, Singapore very much sprung from your friendship with him. Um, Alpha Gallery, the seminal artist-run cooperative gallery um, here, which you had been a staunch supporter of, was also significant in the way that it supported the work that you had done with and about um, Bucky. This included the 1979 exhibition Bucky at, um, Bucky at Alpha, um, and he was there to present, um, he was present there to launch his book, Synergetics Folio, um, which was published in Singapore. And this is a publication I understand that you have been very much involved in as well. And on the first anniversary of Bucky's passing, you also organized the In Memoriam um, RBF exhibition at the gallery with your brother Lim, Ch Lim Chong Bing. Um, Datuk Sri, would you share more about Fuller's visits to Singapore? Singapore and the activities um, that were connected to him here, um, including his stay at the Star Point House in Pasir Panjang. Wow, there's a lot to recap. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, it was very nice to stay with me in, in, in Star Point. And also, we actually had occasions to invite the university students in the NUS mm. to build a pipe dome with him there. So they had exposure already before exhibitions like yours. You know? So people knew about your music. Uh, but you see, actually, from our Champan meetings, we realized that it's the humanist part of Bucky that you should discover beyond being just a, a kind of visit inventor. And I think that's the importance when you read about Bucky. So, but the strange chance is that that year, he published what was called the Synergetic uh, Folio Images. And uh, he had printed them in a limited edition, which uh, Fortunately, I bought two sets. I think they'd be quite valid right now. Maybe I should bring this uh, folio, which I, I think is a truly collector's item. Uh, this was the initiative with Alpha Gallery, which actually ran exhibitions open free to people. And so we firstly saw these posters, which are so important that we decided to do a facsimile print, half size, but big enough uh, of this. And later this figured in this book called Synergetic 2. But the geometry in here is actually very interesting because it showed that he went beyond the convention of Euclidean geometry. So synergetic geometry is one of the great contributions of Bhakti to update ourselves into fundamental structures. Now the interesting part is that uh, I got him to approve this, and he wrote to me, the interesting part is not only the images, but an article called Humans in Universe, which I uh, tried to tell him is a bit not understood by most people, you know, it's, it's too big a subject. So I had the honor of writing the subtitle, and I don't know if you can read from there. So the subtitle, I point for him is from selfishness to synergetics and sufficiency. Uh, I think what is condensed in here, he repeats in his other books like Critical Path and so on, but is a very good condensation. 
And many people will be surprised at his quotations of Rudyard Kipling. The many philosophic things in this condensed article, which we autograph and sign. So I don't know how many copies we have list, but maybe we should be printed. It is really a major contribution from initiatives in Singapore by Alpha Gallery. And it was done within affordable limits then, you know. But it was never done commercially, just to promote the, the culture, the philosophic culture of Bucky. So a, a very important document, which I'm glad you mentioned. So we are so glad that that year we were able to divert him. We actually had two exhibitions. And one with an exhibition that he did in Penang, which we showed a lot of the architects that we showed in the Art Museum, the Art Science Museum. But in Singapore, it was essentially based on this. And he was there to meet people from the Science Museum and everybody else the chance to meet him. And I hope many of the people that turn up will still remember the significant day. So you then mentioned that after Bucky died, we had this memoriam exhibition. Uh, this was the exhibition that we did after he died, which encapsulated a lot of things, including a simple write-up I did about the last time we met, and uh, also showed the significant mm -hmm. happenings in Bali. You know, we talked about the Champong second meeting, which was actually his birthday, where he kind of encouraged me to make this special structure of geodesic dome in bamboo. It was pretty iconic in Bali. A lot of people went there to try to find it. Uh, it's no longer there, but frankly, I hope it can be redone. So I also learned that it was a great event uh, that we had there. So this, this catalog is also a collector's item. And uh, I think you might be, of course, you're, you're going to be prompted on that one. The important thing we put at the back is this inscription on I uh, leave it to you to, to take that up if you want it to. Um, I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on how Southeast Asia might have influenced Bucky's thinking um, and the part that he played in shaping the practice of architects in this region as well, Datuk Sri. Uh, well, I think it wasn't his object to shape architecture at all because he was really a comprehensivist. Mm. And so the, uh, you know, he of course had visionary ideas about building that is built lighter and the whole background to the geodesic dome is not a show of gimmick. It's actually to build more of the less, to try to cover the bigger space with the least means with the fewer modules. So quite unlike all the showpiece uh, structures which you find uh, which are being built as tourist gimmicks today. So simplicity, the integrity of the geodesic the main thing. But then he used to talk about his own Dimexian houses, how light they were. And I, I was friendly enough with him and I realized that he was friendly enough with me when he stayed in Star Point, he never asked me how heavy the building was. <laughs> I not be able to tell him. Just like today, you can ask any architect, including Moshe Safdeh, how heavy the building weighs, they would know. So, but of course, we cannot go into that technology because he was taking off as a possibility after the aircraft industry. Like many industries, they also go wrong. Uh, so, Bucky had a lot of inspirations on structures. But I think his major impact was philosophic. Philosophic, the ideas, how to share the world. The world for you and me, rather than the world for you or me. And I don't know whether you're going to uh, refer to his seminal book called Critical Path, which, funny enough, he actually finished writing it when he was in Bellevue in Penang. Mm. And I have a proof copy, which he mentioned his, his meetings in Penang and so on in the appendix. Now, Critical Path is a very germinal book, which uh, <clears throat> Bucky particularly told me he wished that it could be translated into Chinese. And I believe some people may have tried it, whether authorized or not. But translation should, of course, be vetted so that it carry the scent of the whole thing. 
And from that, you can see his globalist philosophy, the world for you and me, avoid the conflicts to talk about not only peaceful coexistence, but what he call inter-accommodation. Great message for civilization, instead of the nonsense of global politics. Okay? So these are the inspirations which he thought of a long time ago. And of course, it goes back to his original entree into the field when he wrote the book called The Man of the Spaceship Earth. The thing of the world as a whole. And hence, he demonstrated it by the Dimexian map, which I think everybody has turned into models and so on. But the key significance is actually what was called the world game. That in one map, you can see the correct proportion of masses in the world. That's against the Cartesian maps you learn in school, which is wrongly the wrong dimension. So there's an untruth in projection. Incidentally, the credit for the Dimexian maps must also go to Shoji Sadao, who actually was the key cartographer behind it. So Bucky had a lot of collaborators, including Thomas uh, Zhang, who's still a great friend. And there are many people to remember, but Shoji, who passed away, actually was a very important collaborator for Bucky, starting off with the Montreal Dome. So the famous dome in that position there. Uh, in parallel, Moshe did the habitat project. So we should go beyond Bucky, the inventor, the building of structures, to Bucky, the great global thinker and inspirator for the world. Have I gone out of line for you? We're good. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity to um, maybe chat with you um, about um, both of your practices. Um, Bucky wrote shortly before his passing that um, human integrity is the uncompromising courage of self-determining whether or not to take initiative, support or cooperate with others um, in accord with all the truth and nothing but the truth as it is conceived by the divine mind, always available and in each individual. And Dr. Sri, you yourself have also spoken that an architect must design with integrity and discharge responsibility with honesty. And in designing things, um, we need to wholly understand the concept of our creation. And that is an example of integrity, a notion of understanding things as a whole. Um, so I was wondering if you might be able to also speak um, to this shared beliefs um, um, that, that you and um, Bucky have held um, as comprehensivists um, in, in architectural practice. Um, please talk to us about this. I'm surprised you could quote all that. <laughs> Uh, I have to tell you the background, the important background to that statement on integrity. Actually, it is one of the important legacies we left for Bellevue. This is actually written uh, on Valentine's Day and Chinese New Year and presented to Bellevue. It is, we have the original inscription, which I suppose I should tell my heirs to sell to Saturday's Monday. So this is a very important description. So we have it in this original handwriting. I was amazed that you can be salted, because I would have to read it to, to know. Well, it is really a, a very distilled idea of inciting everyone to espouse integrity, not because you follow anybody else, but it has to be intrinsic, inherent in anything you do. Now you swing to architecture, uh, and we apply there or apply to any other activity, engineering or even politics. Uh, does integrity dwell in the performance? In the case of architects, it's very simple uh, because architecture became commercial. So you have names, for example, who take credit for buildings, which actually the underlings did. So that's the first thing. We want to look at buildings, you must know who actually sweated on the whole thing. On my side, we were first practicing in very simpler conditions, whereby in the case of buildings, which I don't mind being uh, uh, described as the architect, I knew everything about the building. It wasn't something done by my underlings or associates, and then I claimed the credit for it. That was the first aspect of integrity. But like all practices, architecture is no longer 
a dedication. It is a business for some people. So when you want to talk about integrity, you have to talk about the work that can represent individual initiatives, not commercial product where somebody gets a job, uh, farms it out, and even gets uh, slaves to draw it up. That is a problem. But I think it leads to another concept that Bakke talked about, which is comprehensivity. Anything you do must be comprehensive, because in a sense, everything is related to everything else. So, for example, if you want to talk about climate change, you really need to know geophysics. What's happening to the Earth moving around? And climate change could be caused not by the common cry about pollution, but by geophysical effects. And then the other factor, which is known in history, which people forget, which have been forewarned by other thinkers, like the people who wrote uh, The Limits to Growth. The world has forgotten the limits of growth. There's overpopulation, which Melters talked about before. So when Bucky talked about sharing the world, people pay lip service to it. Because they don't have really the commitment to do so. So these are the things that make him very important to stimulate thinking about the future of the world. But I've gone astray. So but <laughs> just buildings is, is not important. We should actually also be uh, conservative in our buildings. We don't stop only show off buildings. You see, the dome is not a show off structure. It is so specific. And I guess I should uh, say that I myself is still discovering what the geophysic dome can do, because as I think you knew that I've been starting using them as geodesic uh, shade houses for botany. So part of our, our dedication to Bucky is to remember him by very simple geodesic homes that I share with you in case you want to come to Penang again and see the geodesic dome in Bellevue, which is a very simple tribute to Bucky. And uh, we light it up occasionally, really as a memory of Bucky, and seeing how beautiful it is at night. Simplicity, the economy of means, not trying to show off the big structures. And here, the connection with Bali, go to the Umbus and so on, they have it here. So a lot of people know about this and they can take part, you know. And then uh, the other part with the dome, I don't know whether you know the dome that we designed for him in Bangkok. You know about the dome? You mentioned that in the last chat that we had, yeah. Yeah, the San Juan dome is a very interesting incident because the, the American community wanted to contribute to the King's Park, it's one one, Ramada Ninth Park. And one of the characters happened to know my connection with Bucky mm. and asked me to design this dome, which I asked Sumit Jun Sai to collaborate on. So this is really almost a, the, the last monument to Bucky, a 90 foot geodesic dome, which is in the botanical park. Uh, originally, it was meant to be a cactus dome. And I'd hope they bring huge cactus from the, the, the arid parts of uh, Arizona to be planted here. But they couldn't manage that for quarantine purposes. So it just became a showplace for okay, uh, cactus fanciers. But this dome has been very well kept in Bangkok when I last visited it. I hope it's still so. Because it has another important indicator of Bucky in there. The ground plan embodies the big map, showing the zones in the world, the relative sizes of population, and it was meant to be a lead to the climate that affects the environment. So I, I think we should do an ecotourism pitch for one one park in one park. But this actually is one of the monuments to Bucky, apart from our small little efforts in the botanical geodesic, you know, and then one day I'll tell you more about what we talked about in terms of watering. Um, Fuller, I mean, Bucky was such a remarkably prescient and holistic thinker. Um, and I guess as an ending note to this program, um, I'd love to get your thoughts, um, Tatuk Sri, um, what might we learn from his work 
um, and the questions that he never stopped asking. Well, I previewed it earlier by talking about the humanist philosophy, mm. the book, Critical Path. But subsequent to Critical Path, he had two other books. I guess you know about them. One is called The Grunge of Giants, which he warned about big business spoiling the world. I mean, that's my condensation, not as it is. But do read the book and, and judge it for yourself. Grunge of Giants, following Critical Path. And the last book, which he did not finish, he was finished by his collaborator, Kiyoshi, called Cosmography, which they were actually writing when they visited the Changquan Hall in Penang in 1983. He didn't finish it, but uh, Kiyoshi did the work. So there are many Bucky associates, people like Amy Edmondson, Apple White, who are also friends of mine. And I think we formed a special group that really knew Bucky. And amongst the, the people who are still around, his uh, other partner, Tom Zhang in Cleveland, and Shirley Sharkey, his, his uh, longtime secretary, who is still a witness to the legacy of Bucky, and his own grandson, Jamie, and uh, granddaughter, Alexandra, we are all in contact. So he's not just an image to be publicized, but really a, a, a real inspiration that has lived uh, long enough to passed it over. Anyway, uh, I've always described it as a cosmic synchronicity that we met. It's a kind of two-way thing, you know. And you know that phrase, cosmic synchronicity, happens times. Um, yeah, that, uh, I remember that from your lecture, yes. Yeah. But that, that phrase is not coined by Bucky. You know who coined the phrase? The American Bucky psychologist, Leary. yeah. Timothy Leary, when he mm. was Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <But> again, <laughs> many inspirations and the books of Bucky have to be read and I think Sajjadek's folio gives a very good start. The geometry itself is so hugely uh, important but it, it upsets the conventional mathematicians because I, I think I'd never tell you another thing. One day Bucky told me, why is a lie? Pi, the, the, you know, pi is used mathematically to describe circles and, and volumes, you know. What is pi? Can you recite pi? 3.14, and it comes I mean, on. <laughs> that's right, it's never ending. And incidentally, we used to discuss the meaning of infinity and mm -hmm. zero. Okay, so pi, of course, we conventionalize it to say 22 upon 7, right? So you keep on going 3.1415556. And incidentally, Bucky is such a super brain. That one night he recited to me a 27 digit number. He called the Shehadazad number. You may read about this when I write about it in the book, if it's given to me. Wish me luck. <laughs> I was really trying to finish it, but well, I don't know who wants to publish it. I have to finish writing it. But Sorry, I talked too much, but anyway, you were the prompter. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, Dr. Suri. It, it is really such a privilege for us to um, be able to lean into your recollections and um, interactions with Buckminster Fuller and to hear about all the connections that um, he had made with this region um, through the mutually reinforcing relationship um, that you shared as colleagues and friends. Um, and also thank you to all of you who have been spending your time with us across the duration of this conversation as well. Um, if you might like to delve further into the core ideas, um, the projects and precepts in Bucky's work, do tune in to the online lecture um, presented by the exhibition's guest curators. Um, it's a beautiful presentation that looks at how his influence continues to make itself present today and in contemporary visions of the future. And finally, we would also like to extend our appreciation to National Gallery Singapore and M Plus in the early planning of this program with Datuk Sri Lim. Um, Datuk Sri, thank you so much again for being so generous with your time and sharing. Um, we very much look forward to the release of our upcoming memoir on Buckminster Fuller. Uh, please continue to keep very well. Thank you. Thank you.